Hi, I'm Tony Riddle, and this is the Nat Life Pod, a platform for conversation to help close the gap between wellness as an industry and wellness as a state of being. I firmly believe that ancestral health is modern day wealth, and believe that ancestral health also holds the key to closing the gap between wellness as an industry and wellness as a state of being. Well, my next guest is certainly aligned with this mission and has dedicated herself to bridging the gap between ancient wisdom and modern life and has traveled the world studying the roots of cultures to learn how they guide our human experience and enrich our contemporary lives. In today's inspiring episode, I'm in conversation with the heart-led Robin Leone, an explorer creator and facilitator. Robin shares her potent path into the world of ancestral health and the profound significance of sweat lodges, rites of passage, and vision quests, illuminating Robin's personal journey into these sacred spaces and beyond. We also reflect on how we introduced the UK's first 100 to human sweat lodge at the 100 human experience this year at 42 acres, and how we're thrilled to be introducing this potent medicine at the next 100 in Norfolk called Kindred. It's our first multi-generational experience where we're inviting families to gather, connect and partake in ancestral practices and traditions, including the sweat lodge. Join us as we embark on Robin's journey to rekindle the practices of the natural world in a way that honours our ancestors and nurtures our future's future. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as we did. Now before you get this conversation in your ears, I'm going to introduce you to what feels to me a great partnership. Are you looking to take your strength conditioning to new heights? I'm often asked how I maintain my physique. Surely it can't just be from all those crawling patterns, Tony. Well, it's actually largely my own body weight practices. So yes, crawling is in there, but I'm a massive fan of body weight training. And my go-to for my upper body strength is the gymnastic rings, or more specifically, the gymnastic ring muscle up. When I first introduced gymnastic ring muscle ups to my own movement practice some 16 years ago, my upper body was transformed into an undeniably different, far healthier natural shape. And I found myself in the possession of an entirely new type of humble strength. I now revisit the muscle up three to four times per week as part of my maintenance movement program and find that even into what is now the start of my 50th year on this planet, I'm still connected to that humble strength. So I decided to launch a simple no-nonsense gymnastic ring muscle up tutorial, which you will find the details of in the show notes and have partnered with Gravity Fitness, which are the ultimate destination for calisthenics kit for the gym, home and on the go and are my recommended go-to for durable gymnastic rings. So if you're looking to gain a newfound strength, check out my muscle up tutorial and use the Gravity Fitness discount code, the natural lifestylist for 10 percent off all gravity fitness kit get your ring set up and start your humbling strength journey hey dude <sighs> already how did this morning's go Natasha, really nice yeah i come away like i was a bit like oh. there was a part in there where she was discussing like you know, because we have this perception of growing food, like it's just mm-hmm. hard work, right? Farming's hard. Whereas wild tending is, it's, Different. she could just do something in the afternoon, then she's done for the day and it's mm-hmm. just getting things at the right time or throwing some seeds at this particular time and mm-hmm. then having the patience to allow it to nurture and then come through and then it's all abundant, right, in that yep. sense. And I, and I, I, I kind of listened to it and I went, I went off in my own world with it. And instead of actually speaking about it, I was off in Tony land and I kind of wish I'd spoken to it because I think for many, when we think about growing food, uh-huh. is that the grind and the yeah. stuck to the land and it's such a commitment once you're in it. And for us looking at 28 acres, it's like, well, if we do that and we really want to start building community and growing stuff on the land, then what does that look like? We're just going to be, we're never going to get away anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So it's like once you've made the commitment, you're all in. Yeah. Whereas this was very different mm. perspective. Yeah, it's good for people to hear. Because I think that's for something that keeps us away from it. Is, yeah, yeah. As- but also she shared like, you know, uh, uh, hunger, I guess, for buying land or we think we have to rent the land. Mm-hmm. And she was very much into, you know, kind of wild tend to land. Guerrilla gardening, wherever. yeah. Guerrilla gardening, mm-hmm. that's what she called it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that. On one of our flyers that we put in our, our little packages that we make is um, you already have land and community. And it's like there's land everywhere. You can look after land wherever you are. You don't have to own it to look after it. 
and you don't have to have a community that looks and feels like your perfect community to be mm. part of it. Mm. Um, Is it ever going to be perfect? Exactly. And it's, it's only perfect idea. through your, your lens anyway, right? Exactly. And community is being used as like a we buzzword. Oh, we're just, ro- <laughs> we're just rolling. We're going to keep that all in there because that's brilliant. I want to read something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're rolling. I like that. Subtle start. <laughs> Big pause for everyone they're driving right now <laughs> keep focused keep focused oh, is there wi-fi here root root of the gods right uh-huh. just wait for your website to load <laughs> perfect is a piece in there about indigenous getting back to indigenous roots and our authentic kind of self i'm not going to read it from there i'm just i'm already rolling <laughs> i can go back to my boundary of phones off the table <laughs> nice authenticity yeah. because I, well, I spoke to this on the, we did an event, right? We did a hundred human experience and we were gifted by you and a how holding the first ever 100 human sweat lodge in the UK at the 100 human experience. Beautiful and exactly how I imagined it to be, <laughs> you know? Ugh. It was powerful. Look what I created. No. But, um, visioned. The vision. Seeded. Yeah. I think um, I spoke to the authenticity piece on the, on the closing like this. Building up to that event, there was a lot happening for me and we were moving between houses and closing one house down and not quite ready to move into our next house. And then Katarina, the kids were going back, her mum's not well in Slovakia and that meant them going back. So they were with me at the start of the event. Then there's bell tents arriving. There's all this stuff happening. It's building and building and building. And at one point I had someone asking me a question in front of me, a WhatsApp going on, and then someone else came in and I, I had to become like, okay, guys, just one at a time you know <laughs> one man yeah you know, <laughs> i am one man yeah and um i'm a good listener but nah. <laughs> so um then having then come to saturday and i hold a lot of the saturday myself there's a lot that i hold on that day in terms of the facilitating and by the evening normally tony in front of a large number of people the more people the more i just turn tony volume up but it's subtle that the difference between that and wearing a mask, mm-hmm. like the performer versus just turn your volume up. And I guess as an extrovert with lots of people, the volume just goes up. And yet I had so much going on around me. I, f- I felt that there was something that was out for me just coming into the end of closing really of the, f- the Saturday. And then, I, and then on the Sunday, the final day, I'm then dropping Katarina the kids off. Uh, papa husband role while the men's groups happening in the women's so I was having my own men's and women's circle in the car and then came back to the sweat lodge and then I'm find myself then in the sweat lodge I'm in there for four hours as is everyone else and the it dropped in for me there and then because you there's no mask in there right that's the medicine of that work it really it just really was shining a light on where I was really at. And then it came in, oh my God, I was wearing a mask yesterday. I get it. I wasn't turning with the volume up. And in the closing, I voiced that. And the reason it's important for me to voice that within the closing is because that's the authentic piece. It's the recognizing that's, that's where I'm at. And there's an admission here, guys. I wasn't really holding that great space on Saturday. It felt I had a mask on. But that the beauty of that work again is the authenticity piece and the reason i'm waffling on about it is because you and a how for me um hold what seems to be so many different things are happening around you but you are you i want to just speak to here and honor that is that you you are both so much you throughout that experience and you, there isn't a hint of a mask the long way of complimenting you but it was there anyway <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, I have to say, especially with that, is when you're working with traditional ceremonies and with uh, like protocols, there's like pillars, you know, Mm -hmm. there's pillars that hold us. So we're not just holding ourselves. And I think that's when you're holding a lot just yourself, there is some kind of coping mechanism that comes in where you need a mask sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know? And for me, I feel so wholly supported and like I have this 
deep rooted foundation that goes way beyond my lifetime because we're holding a ceremony that has existed and been practiced for way beyond my lifetime. And for me, that's where that energy and that authenticity and that rootedness comes from. But for me personally, that's how I feel. So I'm really grateful for that always, like to have the fire there. Mm. You can't be fake in front of the fire. <laughs> no, you can't. Um, and you can't fight with the fire. I have to say when I first was helping with the sweat lodges and working with the fire, I used to get burnt all the time because I'd be like in this battle, I'd be fighting with the fire, trying Doing. to get what I wanted out of the fire, which was the hottest rock because I felt under pressure to bring it into the lodge for everyone. Mm. And you, and it doesn't give it to you. It's like this resistance, this not, oh, that's going to fall on top of it. So you can't get the fork under the rock that you want to bring it into the sweat lodge. And when you take a step back and you breathe, which is kind of what happened with you in the sweat lodge, right? It was a, a, a moment where you knew that you could take a step back and breathe mm. and be held. Um, when you do that with the fire as well, and when working with the sweat lodge, you take that step back, you breathe, and you ask permission. You, you engage in a, in a healthy relationship, in a more um, reciprocal relationship. Like, okay, I'm I'm coming in. <laughs> I'm coming close to you, fire. I'm gonna mm. work with you. And I think that's um, I mean, it's a great metaphor that you don't get burned so much, you know. It does it's not so painful. You still feel the heat if you stand on an ember or if you, you know, um if you're working with fire, you're gonna get hot, but you don't feel that pain in the same way, or you don't kind of have this, it feels like sometimes violent interaction with the fire. Mm. It's more peaceful. It's more uh, deep and nurturing. And I feel that's just one of the examples of when we're holding space and when being with the sweat lodge that keeps me authentic. Because um, yeah, you can't you can't be distracted and out of yourself when you're when you're working in that way. Really, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I can I can relate to the embers piece. Like if I'm running on stuff that people go, how's that even possible? And it is the not creating resistance, you know, and not being tense or not trying to control the outcome of that, mm -hmm. just surrendering to whatever it is I'm running on and can then allow my senses to, I guess, authentic senses to come through. Yeah. That. And to and to open and to yeah. realise that that in that opening there is strength. And that's something we're taught so much in our culture, you know, that that being fortified that being like closed is strong mm. but actually like you can withstand and and go through a lot more in that opening that's the um, real understanding of resilience as well yeah yeah being malleable in that sense mm -hmm. to whatever that environment would be yeah um okay so that's getting to that point of the authenticity and the fire and the teachings that come through that fire, um, how did you find yourself at that fire, I guess, is a good question, right? Like where did, where, how did that come together? How did that piece together? Um, I mean, the first sweat lodge that I went to, I got invited to a sweat lodge by an ex-partner um, because he was writing uh, a book, um, Should All Drugs Be Legalised? And it was kind of like looking into the, the history and... Um, the origins of plant medicines, of tobacco, of all of these things that are now called drugs. Um, and the sweat lodges and the fire are something that are closely related to plant medicines and all of those kinds of things. Those ceremonies, the fire is kind of very important in many of them. And yeah, the first time I went to a sweat lodge, I didn't really know what I was going to be invited to or... I didn't understand the Spanish. I just sat in that space. I, I waited a long time, quite a lot of traditional sweat lodges. You arrive at the time you think it's going to be, and there's already a test at hand knowing that it might start like two hours later than you think. Um, so yeah, I was there and waiting and not really sure what I was getting myself into. But when I sat in the darkness and in the heat, it felt familiar to me. It felt, yeah, like nurturing. It, mm. it helped me to drop um, 
masks, I'd say, actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like coming back to that theme of masks, there's something about being in the darkness, but with a lot of people where they can't see you, which is maybe what draws people to like rave culture and dancing in the dark, you know, because they're... Well, I have been, yeah, it's like your inhibitions are gone. And I feel that in the sweat lodge, like it's like the beat of the drum, the songs, the, the darkness, it helps you to just release um, the version of you that maybe has to exist or has been built up because of the outside world and all the bright right. lights and all of the eyes. Um, and it was quite a difficult sweat lodge for a lot of people. And I, I felt like, yes, <laughs> give me it. <laughs> Um, and yeah, since then, any time I've heard or caught wind of a sweat lodge, I've, I've gone every time I could. And so I ended up in, in Mexico and staying for quite a while when lockdown was happening in the UK and I was losing all my work and I just thought, well, I can exist, uh, and survive a lot longer out here in Mexico. So why don't I just follow my notes a little bit? And I ended up in this place called San Cristobal de las Casas in Chiapas. And there was a sweat lodge every week. So I could go every week and it was cheap wow. enough and I could help and I could try and learn Spanish. I didn't speak much Spanish at the time. So again, I didn't really know what was going on a lot of the time. But I felt community. I felt family. It was, it, it's so beautiful to, to experience sweat lodges de mascal in in Mexico, because it really is still part of their everyday culture. Mm. Like if there's a two or three year old's birthday in one of their families, the sweat lodge is about that two or three year old's birthday. They'll come and everyone comes together and they celebrate and they sing to her over the fire. Um, it, you know, it's, it's so integrated into their culture. And for me, that was something that I hadn't seen or felt um, in that way, in such a healthy way, I don't think, <laughs> before in my life. So even though I wasn't really understanding and I didn't necessarily live there for a long time and I wasn't Mexican, just feeling like I was on the peripheries of that was so nourishing for me, um, even outside of the sweat lodge. So, yeah, and it's all, it, the fire feeds all of that. The fire is like the grandfather of that community, you know, bringing everyone together and bringing teaching and strength and um and wisdom yeah and then the the lodge itself being then the mother in that sense right yeah like the holding yeah, yeah the sweat lodge represents the womb the community together within the womb right? yeah it's the place where you can be nurtured and bring fertility to your yeah. your wishes or to to shed to to move things you know yeah, it's certainly a fascinating space. I, I, for me, it's always this harmonising of the physical, social, and spiritual, mm -hmm. and certainly that that was felt on this event. I could really feel how it was it was perfectly aligned for that. You know, we've gone through this whole process together, which has built, I guess, what feels like then a, cl a closer community to then sit in that experience together. But it would be beautiful to have like the consistency of that. Yeah, you know. Because, yeah. again, that could look like many things. It could just look like community fire, that people just meet around the fire once a week and, mm -hmm. you know, and speak to what's happening within the community. And that then helps with the removing of the masks and the authenticity because you can't keep showing up wearing a mask to a weekly event every single week. Yeah. People start to see more of that authentic being coming in. Absolutely. And I think also because we... <laughs> Um, because it can be a bit of a luxury, you know, like well-being and health and all of these things. It's kind of grown into a bit of a culture of a, a luxury or, uh, you know, a, a retreat. It's like, oh, it's like yeah. a holiday. Yeah. Um, so these things that we're sharing, we're, we're actually, and I feel that in your work as well, is we're trying to bridge this as much as possible into the everyday. We're trying to normalize it as much as possible because that's where you really get that... Um, the deeper connection and the deeper benefits because it's not um there's not so much pressure on going to one sweat lodge a year um if you go to one sweat lodge a year it's kind of like oh i need to bring all my intentions and all my things and i need to get loads from it mm. whereas if you know you're going every week you kind of just go and you just feel and we get used to kind of feeling letting go shedding grieving joy and all of it can happen in the same ceremony and it's more acceptance to be in that isn't there yeah um, it's just more normal. 
And I think that we live in a society, especially in the UK and like in Western um, cultures, of extremes. Like we're we're so um, yeah, we're so accustomed to being in extremes. So it's like oh, extreme healing or extreme hiding or. Um, you know, I'm I'm deeply grieving because I've I've hidden it or or I've held on to it for a long time and now it's gonna explode. Uh or I'm feeling nothing and I'm numb and I'm stoic and everything's mm. okay. And I noticed that in the sweat lodge. In Mexico it's it's much more common for them to be expressive, loud, talk over the, the facilitator. Like it's just a lot more kind of fluid. Um, whereas in the UK, if you tell everyone to be quiet, they really, really will be quiet. Um, and they get scared if you say you can't leave the sweat lodge because we really take that as like the absolute extreme. I'm going to push myself into the most suffering and I'm not going to say anything. Um, and we, um, I'll suffer in silence. Yeah. And that's a lot of pressure, you know, it's a lot of pressure to, to live in those kind of two extreme worlds. Um, and I think that's because we're, yeah, very knowledge based it's like this is a truth i read it in a book and therefore it's a, a truth <laughs> yeah which i speak to like the information rich and experience poor you know yeah, whereas exactly. in experiences like that you will learn so much more about yourself really mm-hmm. and of course those around you like what could be the community yeah um what started the journey you know not the i don't just mean the sweat lodge yeah you know, because I briefly met you at, where was it, a medicine festival, I think. Yeah. And I was looking at buying some happy from you. <laughs> and um, I was like, oh, you're Robbie. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you're Tony. Yeah. <laughs> I've got this idea for a hundred human sweat lodge. Yeah. yeah. So where was that? It was medicine, yeah. So that's yeah. last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And your name was popping up, like, boom, boom, you know, like, um, I guess like the medicine. Like when we talk about medicine work, it's like you get the calling for the medicine. Mm-hmm. And your work is very much about the medicine. So I guess that yeah. was the calling. What brought you to the medicine? Let's, let's go with that. That's, that's probably a better that's entry, isn't it? When what we say the medicine, to... are, we, are we speaking plant medicines? Or are we speaking to the medicine of life? Or... The healing of the medicine, whatever that might look like for it's you. Because breath is medicine, right? The fire yeah, is medicine. Exactly. The food, yeah. Let food be like medicine, but... When did it first drop in for you, I guess? I guess at the moment I'm I'm pausing because there's so many different seeds that now are quite clear to me. Yeah. But were they clear to me at the time? So there's this there's this you know story that I could tell from when I was aware or I could go right back to where there were seeds bubbling and planted in my life that I didn't really know were guiding me to this point. Yeah, I can have, I have, there's a big aha moment for me. Yeah. And then, of course, now, later on, like proper being the observer of all of it, Mm -hmm. I can see all the little aha moments, but there was like one major thing for me. Yeah. That I can say, wow, that's when I really kind of shifted a gear. When you got it. But the others were like, no, he's not listening yet. (laughs) He's not listening yet. (laughs) And it was getting louder and louder and louder until it was like, here you go, yeah. boom, here you go, off the cliff, uh, listen. Yeah, I think for me, like I've always been spiritual in some sense and uh, what might have seemed like a little bit odd and weird. And my mum was actually reflecting me to me the other day how I used to sleep, walk and talk and sing all the time. And I'd be like just saying the most crazy things and walking around the house and shouting or singing at them in my dreams while I was dreaming, like mm. weird things happening when I was young. And, and that kind of, uh, I think I was always very curious. I've always been quite like, I need to experience things to learn things. And so that's led me down many rabbit holes and, and into many different experiences. Um, but I think the time when I really kind of took responsibility, because I feel like there is some kind of self-responsibility in following a path and that of medicine or, or choosing how you want to live. And I feel like that happened for me. I'd been living in New Zealand for a couple of years and... 
New Zealand reminded me that I am nature in a way that I hadn't connected with in the UK. I hadn't connected with British soil. I hadn't really like felt that much here. Whereas when I went to New Zealand, it's like so undeniable and they have such a reverence and a love for the land. And I also fell in love with the land and I was also quite lonely and and heartbroken and confused. And it was a lot of emotions for me and the land really held me and taught me and showed me without me really knowing. But at the same time, I was, um, I was getting really into fasting. I'd listened to a podcast and I was getting into fasting and it was more kind of like a cellular healing and like biohacking perspective of fasting, right? Um, My mum was quite sick when I was young and so I've always kind of been uh, on this quest of like, why does that happen and how? And I heard that like um, fasting can help eat cancerous like Mm -hmm. grown cells in your body and I was like, wow, that's so interesting. So I started experimenting with myself as a guinea pig, as I often have in many things. I'm and very much the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I was fasting every day for different amounts of time and, try, you know, in blocks of six weeks, I'm going to try this and da 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 um, And somehow in, in that process over maybe eight, ten months, I decided that on my way back to the UK, before moving back to the UK, I was going to go and stay at an ashram I think because it was also free at the time, I was like, that's cool. I could stay at an ashram for free for 10 days, but also pray and meditate and fast. Um, So, yeah, so I contacted this this ashram and said, because I knew they'd understand fasting, right? Because it's in their culture in Bali, in Indonesia. Um, I said, I'd like to come here and do a 10 day fast. And, And there was a natural water spring there. I knew that I could just reside there. I knew that there was temples. Um, and I think they had a free like yoga style class every morning for the locals, which was not in English. Um, or it wasn't, yeah, in whatever their language is. I can't remember the name of it, but, uh, I was fully immersed in this kind of rural temple setting in this dormitory room. I thought I'd be sharing with other people. Turned out there was no one else there. Oh, wow. So I was in like a 10 dorm room, totally on my own. Um, and I'd prepared, I was going to do enemas and I was going to, you know, journal and I'd researched a lot, um, what to eat before, how to prepare myself and then what to eat after and risks and all of those different things. So it was all quite cognitive until I arrived. It was all quite like planned and like, oh yeah, I've studied all these things and this is my protocol. Um, and as soon as I arrived and I started actually, um, entering into the process and realizing that I was in such a sacred place and going into the temples because there wasn't really that much else to do. I was trying to kind of distract myself basically, uh, to not think about food. Um, and I'd say first I realized how much suffering I'd put my body through. First, I felt like all the drugs, all the fast food, all the like unwanted sexual experiences, like all of this kind of like stagnant, heavy shit. (laughs) Can I say that? Yeah, say whatever you like. (laughs) These Um, mics have heard some stuff. Okay, okay, good. I'm sure these walls have too. (laughs) And Simon, well, he's just heard it it all. (laughs) Sorry, Simon. (laughs) Um, I started to feel it all coming out. That's the first thing that I felt. And Physically, but spiritually, emotionally, like these layers kind of like mucusy sluggishness, like coming away. Dumping, purging. Dumping, purging, yeah. yeah. And I could see it as well because I was obsessed with the enemas. So I was doing daily en- enemas and I was looking at the colours and like analysing the colours of what is coming out of my system um, and, and journaling and writing it down, kind of reporting, I guess. Um And following that kind of like wave of sluggishness and, you know, my eczema broke out, like all these different things, these autoimmune diseases and all this stuff that I'd had throughout my life, really, all just started flaring up and just coming out and coming out and coming out. Um, And then there was an earthquake while I was there. (laughs) So on like day six, I'm about to do my enema. I'm butt naked in the bathroom, (laughs) ready and preparing. And suddenly I'm on the floor and I was like, 
well, that that was weird. Am I just dizzy because I'm fasting? You're you are already a little bit like disorientated. So I got back up, and then it happened again. But things fell off the like the cupboards and things like that. And I was like, no, that's not a me thing. This is a building thing. And I thought, oh, this must be like a. I thought maybe it was like a in my mind. Maybe it's like a big monkey on the outside of this cabin. And then I looked around and I was like, no, it's definitely concrete. Like I'm definitely in a solid building. And one I big think, monkey. Yeah, because it feels more like a boat. It doesn't, yeah. I hadn't been in a like proper earthquake yeah, before, yeah. a strong one. And it felt more like a boat. It definitely wasn't a monkey, definitely wasn't a boat. So I put my trainers on, still naked with my passport in my hand. And I was like, what do I do? You're not doing, <laughs> but you're not doing the enema at this stage. Oh, that's that's enema. okay. That's okay. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't in the process. No. And I thought, shit, what do I do? I need to get off the island. Looked outside, there's coconuts falling, like from, you know, outside was not a good option. So I thought, okay, I'd stay here. So I ended up falling asleep that night, waking up the next morning, and then a few people came to check on me because they knew that I was there, they knew that I was alone, and the locals, they're more used to it. But um, they said, we want to invite you to a ceremony tonight. So they were going to have like a, a ceremony where they all pray together, they dance, they speak. Um, and that it was like a, a kind of like, um, oh, what's it called? It was like a tra train of people, you know, holding on to each other and walking around with candles yeah, yeah, okay. for hours, hours and hours and hours and hours. But they invited me just to sit. So I was just sitting in this environment where they were dancing and singing around me. And I was the only person that wasn't a local there. And I was just meditating and really feeling. Um, and this voice that was like my voice just came and said, it's okay to let go now. It's safe to let go now. And it was like all of these ideas of how I need to be and the responsibility I felt I had in my family, mm. um, these masks, all of these things, they all kind of came and they were, it was like I could see and feel them floating around me. And this voice of mine came to say, now it's time to let go. And I just cried and cried and cried and cried and cried, sitting in the middle of all of this beautiful ceremony. That's a, that's a sobbing at that moment, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, like a release, like, yeah. oh, thank fuck. <laughs> like, I can actually let go of this. It can be that simple mm. in this moment because all the other stuff that was built up over the top of it was gone. Um. And yeah, I think that's the first time I've really felt and realized that my path is in my hands. It's my choices, decisions, um, the space I make for myself to reflect and shed and rest. And, you know, all of that is, has always been and will always be um, my choice. It's a choice. So from there, I, I think I just kept following that and feeding that, like, oh, okay, so if I want to explore this and if I want to stop being so controlling or if I want to stop doing this or if I don't want that kind of relationship in my life anymore, I need to make space and time to explore that. I don't yeah. know what it will come to, but this 10 days, so much has happened just because there was no stimulation, there was no... Distraction. Distractions. And there was a certain element of devotion required and strength because there's so many moments where you think, oh, I could just eat. Like, I could just have something. Actually, after the earthquake, someone bought me a hot chocolate, one of the local ladies. And I was like, I can't. <laughs> she said, even now. I was like, yeah, I can't. I'm really? Sorry. So it's like those moments where you choose to devote your love and energy and time and strength to a path that you know will serve you really you like deeply rather than serve and feed all of these other versions of you that have been created or groups that you think will get you somewhere yeah to be real with yourself to be honest with myself and that's when I think I connected with that uh probably for the first time yeah really reminds me of um being in circles and ceremony 
and there be an intention, you know, what's the intention? Mm. And so many in that room will say, I, oh, I just want to let go. And in my head, I was like, oh, what do these people want to let go of? <laughs> you know, so it's quite new, you know, to the experience. I was like, what have they got to them? What's all this stuff they need to let go of? And then, and then what came out of it eventually with me is, when are we going to let go of letting go? <laughs> yes. You know, yeah. really just yeah. let it go. And then I, then I uh, you know, then I, I did get my um, ass handed to me at one point. <laughs> and then I got it. You know, I was like, ah, oh, that's what we're letting go of. I get it. Yeah. Because there is some dismantling that occurs in all of that, right? Mm -hmm. But again, we can get obsessed with that, you know. We can yeah. become obsessed with um, perfectioning. <laughs> my Spanish gets mixed with my English sometimes. And okay. I'm like, uh, Everyone knows what you mean. <laughs> perfectioning. Yeah. Um, perfectionism. Perfectionism or like perfecting. There we yeah, go. Yeah, perfecting. There you go. Um Expecting once we realise we want to be better or different um, or remove certain things, there can be like a quest of perfection, which I think that um, it's natural. I realise especially like with myself and with other people that have kind of come to a point where they find a spiritual path or a healing path or, a, you know, just to be well or to be better in, in what feels good to them. There's a natural rhythm which takes you to some kind of extreme in that to then come back and find a balanced way of living. Um, and I think it's sometimes necessary to kind of deep dive into things and, yeah, become obsessed and, like, mm. focus on all of those things and consume as much as you can to then let it go. <laughs> to let it go to find that kind of equilibrium of how it can really benefit you in your life, but also to continue living your life as as a as a human and not like a, a perf perfect um, healed, you know, never wavering being. Because mm. I think that that's quite often a, an illusion that can be created around people that that are well, healthy, spiritually connected, all of these different things. And that's definitely something in my work that I try and flick off as much as possible. Um. So that people realize, um, even though I walk this path and it is my work and my life and I've had a lot of incredible experiences that have taught me a lot and I have, you know, the wisdom of the fire with me in my path and, you know, I'm connected in that way. It doesn't mean I know everything or I'm well or I don't face the challenges of life. It just means or my relationship. Right? Exactly. It just means my relationship to the challenges of life is are different than what they used to be. Um, so yeah, I really like to step away from that illusion that we can create. Yeah, or but it's also what others can create or their expectations. Mm -hmm. you know, at, the, oh, at the start of this last hundred human, there was a guy who's been introduced to me and was from Australia. It's like, Tony, I'm so good to me. I'm such a massive fan. And I was like, come here. <laughs> and, I, and I just said, um, and I learned this. Who is it from? I think it's over in Ireland anyway. Um, my shit stinks too. No, can we get past this and just be like, you know, uh -huh. and let's have a hug. Yeah. Because again, it's like we can be put on when you're in that sphere and facilitating or coaching, we can also be put on pedestals, right? Yeah. And then it's only a matter of time before, well, we're only human. Mm -hmm. So what tends to happen is that pedestal that you've been put on, you get knocked off the pedestal, but it's their pedestal they've put you on. You know, yeah. it's very, it's a very interesting space. Though. Yeah. So that authenticity piece is equally it's so important within that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be conscious of how how much other people, the way that other people treat you mm. feeds your idea of yourself. Yeah. Um, and I definitely noticed this with indigenous elders and people that have great responsibility, really, that they've inherited through their lineages and their sharing plant medicines and, and powerful altars. Mm. They, of course, receive so much praise and adoration, and, and it's beautiful because it changes people's lives. But I do see that the, the best ones, in my opinion, that I work with 
have this kind of uh it's like a love cloak <laughs> it's like this kind of allowing all of that love and and gratitude to just wash over them and around them and there's mm. not even like this engagement there's not even a response sometimes or even eye contact it's just like Humble. i hear you and you're speaking with something way greater than me mm. actually when you say thank you to me and you you are grateful for this work you're you're speaking to something way beyond me and they really understand and acknowledge that um and that's what keeps them humble i think <laughs> and that's so needed because any of us can can tip into that kind of ego inflation guru complex thing that's happened a lot in in yoga and and in other kinds of big health and healing movements that have come to the west so yeah i take great guidance and inspiration from that to to really stay connected with that humility always and know that actually what comes through me most of the time is not even mine anyway and that's what helped me to step into facilitating for so long i was like oh am i ready and da, 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 because i didn't do this training i didn't do this that and a lot of people ask me where did you train what did you do da, da, da. And the one thing that actually enabled me to step into uh, a service and facilitate a role was realizing that it's not mine in the first place, what I've got mm. to share. That's what helps me to not hide. Mm. Is to, when that voice comes to say, but who are you to share that? Or who are you to sing that? Or who are you to help this person? It's like, who am I to, to stop it? Who am I to contain that or block not mine it's the source of something much greater mm. um to get deep <laughs> that's the honor that's the on, the honoring of the practice as well right yeah and the lineage of a practice yeah to be able to speak to it from that stepping aside and letting it come through mm -hmm. um i guess those that aren't familiar and i know how's not here and I, he'd normally step in with this piece and i'd say can we unpack what sweat lodge is and he mm -hmm. so um for those that aren't familiar and there will be people that aren't familiar with a sweat lodge yeah can you run through a sweat lodge yes of course um so a sweat lodge which um from the lineage and where i've learned which is mexico as i mentioned is called temazcal Temascal is a, a Nahuatl word, which is a traditional indigenous language in Mexico, uh, meaning hot home. So Temas, hot, Cali, home. And sweat lodge structures are actually found in many places around the world, even in the south of England, in Ireland. Sweat lodge, in one form or, or another, has traditions and lineages in many parts of the world. However, the place which it has been most preserved um, is in the Americas and mm. one of them in Mexico. It's a cultural ceremony and it's most associated, I'd say, with like a steam room sauna. It's very different, but it's, it's a hot place, like a hot home. And it represents the womb of Mother Earth for them. So much like a, a womb, it's dark, it's wet it's warm, it's fertile, it's nurturing. And you go in together as a group, a community or a family, and it's broken into four different rounds. In those four different rounds, once you're inside, we'll bring in hot rocks, which have been heated on the fire. They're volcanic rocks. They're sometimes red as the heart of the earth, which they are. Um, and you'll bring them in gradually. So the heat gradually builds mm, the intensity of that yeah and like not like a sauna a sauna you step in it's already hot so this is kind of like a real um collective um rhythm mm. like a, a collective breathing that happens with the rocks the fire the water and everyone that's there and that's guided by song drumming speaking sharing sometimes silence breathing um and yeah each round we will bring more rocks in and the heat will build but whilst also this yeah this breathing happens 
the way that we do it in the UK is more NEP style, which is from the north of America. And with that, it's made of blankets and like could be bamboo or like bendy wood. Um, and it's like an igloo shaped, very close to the earth. So you're mm. sitting on the earth. Last week in Cornwall, we were sitting in the mud. <laughs> you know, it's a very kind of primal sensation. A lot of the people that we receive can be like nature lovers, but they've always got hiking boots on or they've always got some kind of waterproof on or something that kind of yeah, like protects that. them That's from it. that nature, which is that they love. Mm, has to be the perfect situation. I love nature if I'm in control. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and this is not that, you know, no. this is I am connecting with nature in a way that I am touching and being and breathing and singing as nature. And that's for me the thing I, I love the most about it. It's very primal and, and elemental. So, um, yeah, it can be, it's a, it's a cleaning really. It's, a, it's like a community bath, but it's a community bath where you can clean your heart, you know, your, your emotions start to move with the water. It's, it's very wet inside. It's very steamy. Um, you can clean your body. It's incredible for lymphatic drainage. It's really good for your skin. To, to open your pores so everything can breathe, your hormones and toxins can come out. It's great for breathing. You can open up your chest. Like if you imagine when you're in a sauna or after exercise, you can stretch a bit deeper. You can breathe a bit more. It's like that um, in a more restorative way. Um, and the mind, because the beautiful thing about that darkness, which it's dark inside, um, which quite a lot of people can find quite difficult. As soon as they enter, it's like, oh, it's dark. What can I see? My mind, right? Your mind starts going ding, ding, ding. And you see all these things that are happening anyway outside. It's just when you sit in the sweat lodge, it becomes more obvious. We often say the things that come up in the sweat lodge are not created in the sweat lodge. They're things that we carry with us every day. These thoughts, this busy mind, these emotions, this tension, this back pain, like all of these things. Yeah, they might show up in the sweat lodge but you're going to have to walk away with them if you decide to leave right now or you could sit with them right now and you might be able to walk away free from that um so yeah the mind is very interesting as soon as we kind of go into that dark space where we are allowed to soften if we if we let ourselves the mind comes in like no 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 don't like this oh it's this no no don't like this control i don't know what's going to happen and I love when we have children in the sweat lodge because they just say what's on the mind. Like, it's dark in here. Oh, it's hot. Why is it so hot? Why are you singing so loud? Rocks. All rocks. <laughs> like, yeah. everything is just like this, this commentary that we yeah. all have going on inside of us. And they just express it. So, um, yeah, it's really beautiful to see that kind of like mind narrative that comes. But quite often, even with the children, after the first round or into the second round, they quieten down. Quite a lot of them sleep or rest or end up singing and on the shaker or on the drum, um, full of joy and, and life force. And it's just, yeah, it's a beautiful way to just kind of filter out and clean that, that mind, the heart and the body all at the same time. And that's the holistic system of the mind, body, spirit, you know. Mm. And some people, I think, maybe will come to a sweat lodge and they just might experience the phys physical benefits, but the other ones are still working. And I like that yeah. accessibility. I think that's, that's something that I think is really powerful about the sweat lodge is it is just rocks and water and earth. And that's what we spoke to in the closing. Yeah. You actually unpack you know, I, I, it's the level of connection, isn't it? Like I speak to, oh, what did we really do? Oh, we played. Mm -hmm. We did a bit of movement. Yeah. We did some breath, but we're always breathing anyway. <laughs> and we had some nourishing food. Um, we got in some cold water. And then we climbed into a framework with blankets on it with a hole in the ground that we put hot rocks in and poured water on. <laughs> and 
look at what we created and and again that's i think there is the there's the cleansing of it and like all these experiences and what i think it really highlights for me and what i spoke to in that closing was really it's the connection the community and the ceremony Mm -hmm. they're the things that we're really missing and i guess through those traditional cultures and why that happening weekly because it does it unity the unity it brings that common unity it gives mm-hmm. them something to come together as a collective um and then perhaps then we aren't trying to fill the void or look for the distractions because those deeper needs are being met in those experiences mm-hmm. you know yeah feels like that for me and and i guess the more you visit it the more layers or the deeper you understand that practice alone, even like the sweat lodge is like the first one you might go to, yeah, really physical experience. And then it might be another layer and another layer and another layer as we go. And then we can fully speak to it, right? Yeah. Just yeah, I think that, is. that shows as well when we try and, uh, again, put it on this this scale of extremes that we have. Yeah. People say, oh, how hot's it going to be? Yeah, and if you go every week, you realise that one could be really hot, and you're there enjoying, soaking, drinking up all of it, and one could be like, you know, not not too warm, but you could feel like, oof, that was hard. So it's not always um, much like life. It's not always difficult in the way that we expect it to be, and that's the beautiful thing about working with nature in its many forms is mm. so unpredictable yeah yeah i love it <laughs> yeah it's so unpredictable hence us trying to control it yeah. so much right yeah i love the bit about the kids because i'm not going to look that way simon <laughs> just so everyone knows yeah I, I have a habit of turning this way when i'm thinking so i'll turn this way when i'm thinking so you can see i'm thinking um there we go. It's meant to do it again. It's a habit over that. So like, what's going on over there? We should swap sides. Oh no, we can't. No, we can't. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> so speaking to the kids, because we had a, we have a sauna, right? And um Tallulah, when Tallulah would get in the sauna, she she Tallulah will just speak whatever it is, it will come in. So she immediately, you know, oh, it's sweaty. <laughs> oh. It's so hot in here. Yeah. I can't stand it. You know, and it's that voicing of it. But again, it is what we're we're thinking it. And again, we we tend to put a lid on it. But there's that full expression. I think it's so glorious to be around that. Simon and I were speaking earlier. There's the other side of kids, you know, when they don't have small talk. Mm. You know, so if we if if we walk into a space, we have a little bit of small talk, so we may start a conversation until the conversation gets rolling. Whereas if you put kids together, they have this moment. And it's a bit like two dogs meeting, you know, and they they really suss each other, sniff and suss each other out. That's what kids do. It's yeah. really interesting. And then they start to then wind the play up or whatever that looks like. Mm-hmm. But again, it, they don't have the, I guess, the mechanisms of distraction. They actually give you a full expression of what that emotion would be. That's what I, I And I do feel that came through for me in that last sweat lodge was the... This is where you're really at right now, and the the one I the and I had to really work with the heat because I I've never been that great in the heat. If I'm honest, like we lived in Ibiza and it was just like I was Tallulah. Oh, it's sweaty. <laughs> oh, it's so hot. And I'd go from the thinker, I'd get in the pool, and then go back to the thinker. It was kind of that, and I'd hide. And then since getting the kind of the, since we had the sauna, I'd, every day. And I worked at it, so it was very much like the cold for me, like the practice of getting in the cold. And for some, getting in the cold is how I would probably, I had no problem with that really, but for some, I guess it's that same experience getting in the cold. I had it with the heat, and I'd, every day I'd show up. But again, Sweat Lodge is so different to that sauna experience. Yeah. As you say, it's already hot when you're getting in there, so you're like hit immediately, whereas there's that building of it. And what I love in there is when because they're called doors because the door opens right so that's just the time period of which you're in there um is when it opens because you know you were saying there's like a there's a there's a there is a breath it's like that but you hear it don't you and the door opens and you hear this ah oh. <laughs> but we had a hundred people like 
ah, and it kind of went round. You know, you see, if you've been in a dome, like a dome, like a geodesic dome before, yeah, where yeah. you hear something on this side and it goes ooh, all the way round. Uh-huh. So, well, I'm a bit mindful what I say over here. They're going to hear me right over there. <laughs> and um, yeah, it felt very much like that with a hundred people in there. It was. It was really powerful. And I have to say, the process throughout the weekend clearly prepared everyone very well because it the way that that many people held their space and really went in mm. it was no more um difficult or like it didn't take more for it how to hold that many people that it would have 20 or 30 people that hadn't had those ice bath breathing movement and community exercises before mm. and i think that speaks to what we're saying about going into these experiences like weekly or more or more regularly as more regularly as possible is yeah you can really connect with it yourself you're not looking to the guide you're not looking to for someone else to tell you what to do in that space they knew their breath Mm. they knew their bodies by that point because they'd had days of expressing feeling pushing reflecting like you know this how calls it spiritual exercise it's all just spiritual exercise it's like okay i'm exercising my spirit yeah yeah how does that feel Ooh, what's that version da, 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 da. and you could feel that yeah everyone was really well exercising their spirits like all in <laughs> yeah and yeah. that's powerful to have that experience with that many people together um that also felt so peaceful and rooted and and yet powerful and fiery at the same time. It was pretty epic. Yeah, back to kids, because we have a family one coming up, right? So there's a family one happening at Happy Valley in Norfolk, October, 11 to 13. And um, the sweat lodge wasn't on the menu for that until we had it here, because I was like, oh, it'd be great. How is it with kids? And you'd unpack, oh, well, the kids the really young ones might come out after the first door and then the others you might find they're actually sleeping in there because in your mind you think sweat lodge, well, that would be a bit extreme for kids. Well, actually, it's not. You know, and if you get down low and you are on the ground, it's really quite cooling in a way, you know. And for them to feel, the, the thing for me with this next one, because it's the first time we've invited, like, kids in, like, the families, is because around community it always feels, well, The strength really is in the community for me, that piece. And the 100 Human has always been about that, but yet I don't have kids there. And it's like, well, I can have a community without kids. And yet the same breath that, you know, the proverb, which is, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. We will all learn so much together within that process. And 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 the idea of this next one called Kindred is that we... It's not like you're dropping your kids off or taking them to the kiddie event. It's like we're actually going to go through the whole thing together. So we learn so much from the kids going, it's hot, it's cold, it's this, it's that. And at the same time, they'll be learning so much to us. So it's like this, that's the beauty of community, it would feel, you know? Yeah, and I think that removes like this veil of hierarchy that parents know what they're doing and um you know that doesn't exist in traditional and indigenous communities it's it's teamwork it's transparency Mm. it's authenticity coming back to that again you know so i'm really excited i think it will be so insightful for both the adults and the children in equal measure yeah, and I think for those without children, I think that's yeah. also it can be very healing. It's like when we when we hold experiences and the kids are around and there's very much this, oh wow, Tony, you don't realise how healing that's been for me. Mm. I didn't want to have kids because I thought it mean meant would mean I wouldn't be doing this stuff. Mm, yeah. You know, I would know I'd have to give this up or yeah. I'd stop doing this or um just on my own experience of friends around me that are parents or being parented mm-hmm. i'd never really wanted kids so i think there's a there's a healing part to that whole piece yeah yeah like reimagining that multi-generational community yeah why does it have to be kids and adults <laughs> drop know? them off at the crash oh. so i can go and work out yeah <laughs> you know yeah whereas we're gonna play completely play 
together in that process. So you just got back from um, Cornwall? Yeah. At Kudvar? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How was that experience? What was that like for you? The NatLife Pod is a platform for conversation to help close the gap between wellness as an industry and wellness as a state of being. This is also what underpins our online community, the NatLife Tribe. The NatLife Tribe is a growing health and natural lifestyle community where we offer weekly natural movement sessions, breathwork sessions, and hold a check-in safe space for the community to share, connect, and raise a hand if help is needed. This is a great space to embody the practices that we often speak to on the NatLife Pod. Full details on how to join the NatLife Tribe are in the show notes. I hope to see you moving, breathing, and sharing in there real soon. It was challenging. The weather in England sometimes just comes and it's the boss. (laughs) We arrived and we were... Yeah, setting up in the rain, the whole sweat lodge was in the rain. And everybody, Al commented, he was like, wow, British people are so resilient with the weather. Um, because it's amazing. When, when people are really presented with an experience, and especially I think something like the sweat lodge, like a, a ceremony which we probably all come from at some point, you know, we are all elemental, primal, muddy, sweaty beings. Um, We just get stuck in. Everyone just got stuck in. It was windy and rainy and we were all around the fire. We, we explained a little bit what was going to happen. And and it was like, are we still in? Are we still going to do this? And yeah, everyone got stuck in and it was really beautiful, powerful sweat load. And yeah, for some people, they commented life changing and that they de- mm. they definitely didn't expect it to be um, what it was for them. And yeah, I think one of the things about doing this work is it shows you A, how much we're in comfort a lot of the time and we attach ourselves to that but be how natural discomfort is Mm -hmm. and you know like sweat lodge is part of a like the vision quest which is a rite of passage really um you know in in africa in asia and in many parts of the world they still have traditional rites of passage and especially in the uk i feel like we've neglected lost or, or or judged a lot of these kind of transitional moments in our lives we got on our own right yeah and then we have like the pseudo versions of them right? mm-hmm. exactly or that whether it's the becoming a man or um starting your first period or menopause becoming an elder you know elders are just a lot of the time it's like oh granddad's telling this story again about the things it's like we're not listening anymore we're not looking um in a multi-generational way for our children our elders for for all of it to be our teachers and i think that not honoring that that rite of passage um or not having rites of passage anymore is is part of that i feel like though they're connected you know and most rites of passage that are traditional and that have been practiced for thousands of years are really uncomfortable and really challenging. Mm. And there's definitely something to be said for that. So it might not be great marketing, me saying like sweat lodges are difficult in the rain and you turn up and it's challenging, but it's true and it's necessary. And that's what I feel we need actually. Um, More than more comfort and clean, nice white wellness spaces of, yeah, pleasure, you know? Yeah, more like linear step. boxes, void of a sensory expression of what it is to be human within them. I, yeah, I, I, 100%. I think the the discomfort piece is in there. I There was a experience here that I was part of and I held space for. And um, I started it in the yurt here. So it's kind of familiar floor, sitting in a circle experience. And then right now we're going to go out into the grass and it had kind of rained and was on and off rain. But there was a rewilding kind of theme running through the experience. And it was like, okay, so now like you do is just, we're going to lie down on the grass. You're just going to lie down head in hands with your, and just 
and there was kind of the moment, you know, there's a moment when there's, is he being serious? We're actually going to lie down in the grass. <laughs> and it's like, you know, we want to connect to nature, mm -hmm. but again, there's, there is not, this, it has not to, like that. It, not when it's cold, <laughs> not when it's wet. Yeah. There's the seasons and really the rewilding experience is if we don't lean into the discomfort, mm -hmm. just our survival part of brain, our brain alone would have us wrapped up in her, in a home, mm -hmm. you know, not wanting to go. So I really do feel like the rites of passage, I think we recognize them, like perhaps there is this free through to puberty experience of it right but to speak to the revisiting things like the sweat lodge that's revisiting discomfort you know which builds resilience over time right and the more you lean into it the more that we can actually build and cope with as a mechanism you know i speak to things like bungalow legs oh i started living in a single story home therefore the stairs become difficult one day mm -hmm. Or um, what I really went down a rabbit hole recently was I'm using a cast iron frying pan, right? And we talk about forever chemicals, you know, uh, to using Teflon or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. We should steer away from that because the chemicals and get back to using a different type. And for me, it was, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy this um, um, cast, iron. cast iron frying pan, right? And suddenly the weight of my cast iron frying pan and then it and then it takes me into my my head and i'm like oh my god right, think of granny you know like making the fry up with this huge great for big big families with eight these children huge, eight kids my <laughs> mum's one of eight right right cooking in one of these things yeah. right and then the care that we'd have to have because you can't just leave them because they'd rust right so then you have to get oil back into them and look after them so the there's even a not about washing up or the resentment of washing up and putting things in the dishwasher. There's actually the aftercare after that that goes into it. Mm -hmm. But the resilience of being able to wield a frying pan like that, yeah. And we remove stuff like that I mean, with even more comfort, even more comfort. Where do where do we end up? So I think that multi generational piece, the beauty of that of what you've expressed is that it, it they're they're firstly they're experiencing something altogether, mm -hmm. but also for the younger generation seeing that. Uh, the elder generations can experience this too, you know, rather than, oh, they're old. And I think that's the difference between older and elder. Yes. You know, it's like culturally we've handed over so much now. Yeah. We've outsourced so much. We've created so much comfort. I guess there is this tuning out or not listening so much to who we perceive as being old, not elder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had my 92-year-old grandmother in the sweat lodge. There you go. And she gets it. Yeah. Of course she does. The same, we're the same. And there's so much wisdom. There's so many teachers all around us. Mm. Um, and I feel that we seek teachers that can give us accreditation or, you know, a degree or some, mm. some kind of blue tick rather than seeking wisdom and knowledge or experience in teachers that are everyday, everyday teachers, you know, yeah. the ones that sit around your breakfast table, the ones that work in your local shop, mm. um, community teachers and, and wisdom is all around us all the time. The if wisdom we keepers. Open, yeah, open ourselves to it. So rites of passage, would you say you're, do you recognize like getting your period for the first time? Do you think that's like your rite of passage or do you think n now knowing that perhaps, mm -hmm. or would you say that your rite of passage was perhaps what your fast was in India? Cause you know, you're saying if you look mm -hmm. back, there's different times. Can you now see that differently through rite of passage? For me, my rite of passage, if I look at it, I'd like to create for Bowman. He already had one at the age of four when he stopped breastfeeding. So we breast, Katerina breastfed him until the age of four until he then, oh, it's my fourth birthday coming. So mummy's not going to have any more milk. So I, can we do this, Papa? Can we stay in the bell tent, just you and I, and we have a fire? So he chose this process where he wouldn't be with Katerina that night. So he wasn't tempted and we'd be in the bell, but he decided that at the age of four, but that's kind of his first one, you know? 
Whereas for boys, again, like what our voice breaks and we possibly get ridiculed for it. Mm -hmm. And it can be girls get their period and they're, they're actually ashamed of this thing that comes in where we've Lola, we celebrated with Lola. She came down the stairs and she went, guess what, Papa? I've got my period. <laughs> yes. You know? And I was like, do you know what? That is just the, what an amazing thing I've just experienced. Yeah. You know? Yeah, to embody and embrace and express. Mm. Wow, yeah. No, mine wasn't quite like that. I felt like when I got my period, it felt quite inconvenient to me. I was no longer able to function as my boobs started to grow, my body started to change and I started to bleed. Mm. I was no longer able to function like the boys and I was very sporty and I loved playing and all of those like running, mm. lots of things. And so for me, it just felt like an inconvenience, to be honest. Um, and it took a very long time, I'd say until I was in early 20s, maybe mid 20s, to actually start to accept, embrace and also not exploit um, what it was for me to be a woman. It, it takes a long time. And, and I, I didn't have Speak to that. exploit. Go to that. Exploit. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, to use it to my advantage, basically. Yeah. To say I was older than I was because I had boobs younger than what you might perceive. Mm -hmm. mm, is like a 14-year-old. I might have looked like an 18-year-old. So I used that to my advantage, which meant yeah. I could drink, I could go out, I could tell people I was older than I was. I got myself into, yeah, sticky situations. I, um, yeah, I kind of, I used my body to, to feel more confident, but from an external source. Mm. So it distracted me. It's distracted me what would have been maybe like a normal, natural path if you have kind of support, stability, elders, people around you of growing into a new body, into a new version of yourself, which you feel maybe confidence, playfulness, sexuality, all of these different th things from within yourself. And because other people started to notice those changes sooner or accept it sooner than I was ready to because I didn't have that support. Mm -hmm. This idea of who I was, which was an, an older person, became projected onto me. So then I just had, kind of had to jump to where they were at, right? Which then left me in a place where I was constantly in a... It was like external validation, external mm -hmm. confidence which meant that it could be knocked and broken and I could end up in pain quite easily um, because I didn't have any of that. We haven't built the self-esteem over that time. Right? No, I didn't realise I was a woman yet. Mm. <laughs> I still felt like a child, but people mm. started treating me like a woman or a young woman at least. And that was very, yeah, very confusing for a long time. So I... I found the best result for me at that time because I still wasn't ready and I didn't have the tools or understanding of uh, how to embrace that really truly. I thought, well, I can at least take advantage of it. I can at least gain some things from it. I can at least get what I think I want out of life from it. Um, and I feel that's quite common. Mm. I feel that is common for a lot of young women. Yeah. Confusing time. <laughs> I don't want to scare you with your children. <laughs> you know, they're they're amazing. I think I I I mean I we often say it and people often say it when they meet them, they just Tony, they're like so, again so grounded. It's so like, grounded. How is that? Yeah. And, and I think it's largely they're not in a in a system where it's all the same age group. Mm -hmm. And so the schooling system isn't there. I think that's it. Yeah. But also Katarina's like really just that's her energy I feel that comes in. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Tallulah's a lot more like my energy, really. God. It's hot. Oh, I'm sweating. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So we haven't had that, but we did we did 
we have again we've created kind of the here's the ceremony for this mm -hmm. so looking at I, um amanda scott's boudicca series mm -hmm. and there's a there's almost there's the rite of passage talking about um she's young and um, she's now in the circle and her period comes and what the women do is they, then she's within the circle. She then is almost like a vision quest and she goes out on this vision quest and sits. And it's then what messages come to her from the nature at that size, what's coming through her, I guess, as a process. And it's like a 24-hour process before then coming back into the women's circle. Mm -hmm. So it's like, again, ceremony, right? Mm. Um and we created kind of for Lola, it was very much like this ceremony, but from the from the elder women that are around her would offer some kind of advice, mm. you know? Yeah, like the red tents, the red yeah. tents we've lost. It's like to try and bring that back somehow to a tradition or culture. But again, it's like there's in I think I guess in the process of remembering, and this is where we're at, what feels like in the UK at least, in this Celtic kind of consciousness that came, that's th coming through, mm -hmm. the remembering is just as messy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we talk about doing the work and doing the work, the trauma works, so it can be really messy in there. Whereas I think the cultures, again, that have had these, that there's, you can, it's evident the lineage because it's still there, like the sweat lodge that you speak to. It's not some up, there is no remembering in that. Mm -hmm. Whereas we're almost like trying to put this together, a bit like rewilding an estate. I'll try this tree over here. We'll put some beavers in, <laughs> yeah. you know, and <laughs> we're, that works. we're doing that, <coughs> it would seem, until we yeah. can find something that works. Yeah, and I feel that's, for me, one of the kind of, long-term visions with the sweat lodge it's like for me it felt like a remembering straight away mm. we do have structures still here in in our lands yeah so the the learning that i'm experiencing and and the protocols the lineage like the the preservation that still exists with the sweat lodge in mexico and in other places can help me to understand how that might have been here so it's kind of seeds of hope really for me it's kind of like it's fertilizing this idea of like oh so we might have so ha have had songs um that helped us to feel like this or what might yeah. those songs have been like yeah um because it is a complex um technology like biology is like ancient science you know there's there's so much to it and the way that I learn, like I mentioned before, is through experience. So only through holding sweat lodges for years and years and years and years will I actually be able to even touch on potentially what it might have been here through those experiences and through actually being part of that ancient system, that alchemy of the fire, that the ancient technology of, of the songs with the copal, with the, with the door, you know, like... And that's the other thing that uh, really I want to bring Sweat Lodge as much as possible to the UK and as, as regularly as possible for people, whether it's with us or, or whoever, um, is because we can all start to connect with that. We can all start to tap into that. Um, I call it the ancestral art of living. It's mm. like, it's art, it's expression, it's, it's joy, it's juicy, it's living is an is an art and and the way that it was once done for me and the way that ceremony is held and these kind of traditional protocols are the most yeah beautiful precious powerful portals to what it means to be human beautiful <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, you can because you can you can see the well. There's the lineage of wherever we are in those experiences. Like we, if we have sweat lodges here, we also I had George on recently, a guy talking about Tai Chi, and we started to unpack the Dantians, like these energy. Um, you have a lower Dantian, middle Dantian, upper Dantian, um, which is like vessel. But and then in the Celtic consciousness, there's the three cauldrons. So we have a lower cauldron. A middle cauldron and an upper cauldron it's exactly the same language mm -hmm. and the lower one being life force and the middle one being this 
pauldron that's you're born it's on its side and as it flips up you have joy and as it moves down you have uh, grief so it's mm -hmm. always at this play and then you're born with your cauldron down on your head and as you become more awakened and uh, um uh, 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 yeah awakened enlightened the cauldron will then be up but it can't be up the whole time because we'd all be nuts <laughs> yeah can't walk around enlightened all day so the cauldron then tips down again so it creates like an egg shape in a way but then that's incredible because the first recognition of that in in these lands in these lands yeah borders <laughs> get off my land um was fourth century yeah and then it was christianized in the 14th century but again, if we look to the east, the, these these things are happening at the centre. There is a communication of them anyway. What is that sophistication of that communication? So it'd be interesting. It would be really interesting, right, to unpack if those sweat lodges were discovered in the UK, what that really looked like. And it has to have similarities to it, of course, right? But again, what's the what's the language? And because, like in the druidry course I'm doing, and like the bardic work, there there is language and. And there is ceremony and there's ceremony of these get off my land, these lands, mm -hmm. which then raises the potency of that medicine of that work. You know, so whereas you would go to Mexico, you might find ah, because of the tradition of that and the song and everything is geared towards that's the environment. Mm -hmm. that, that medicine would be more potent in a sense, that makes sense? Yeah. To hear. So a bit like using Aho versus Awen or Akwen, depending mm -hmm. on where you are. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because it's activating this this tool, which is our body, by, uh, like, speaking a word is a vibration. Mm. And sometimes it's the way that you use your mouth and what that activates in your brain. And, you know, you're, you're, yeah, you're activating your body as a tool to connect with a certain vibration mm. that might have been practiced in ceremony. Yeah. Um, and that's the fascinating thing with indigenous languages is they're just not used or built in the same way that modern English or even Spanish um, or other languages are. They're not used in the same way. So many indigenous languages, they don't even have a word for nature because mm. everything is. Everything is, yeah. <laughs> it's just, um, yeah, for me it's really fascinating. So... Yeah, to bring back those words that we might have used on these in these lands pre kind of modern English that we might have used in ceremony and to to use them as much as possible because we are kind of calling in, but we're also kind of yeah, creating a vibration. The more it's used, the more potential there is to kind of access more knowledge, more wisdom, more understanding. And we'll, we'll mm. tune ourselves in with, okay, this is what I feel when I say that. So then when we start to play with potentially other ideas or songs or, or instruments, it's like, oh, that, I that feel feels that. similar. Mm. That feels aligned with that. Okay. And I feel that that's potentially, we're going to have to be playful with it. <laughs> we're going to have to try 100%. things because, like you say, a lot has been lost. Mm. And I think that, yeah, for me, that's why I have traveled and studied with many other cultures and other lands is because I carried a lot of shame around these lands and our culture. I was again in like an extreme mindset of like, oh, we raped and pillaged and, and everything that we carry is dark and I'm ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And it was only from being with Ahau really that he was really pushing my buttons on those things because he knew so much about his culture and I knew lots about other cultures, but when we came to these lands, he was like, so tell me about this, tell me about that. Um, and I just burst one day. I just burst in like pain, rage, fury, shame. I was just like, I, I can't, I can't tell you. Like I'm, I've lived my whole life hiding from it, running from it. Mm. Um, and only through that kind of acceptance that Yes, I have been ashamed for it, but no, that doesn't need to exist. That story doesn't need to exist anymore. And it's not an extreme. At the same time that we had people traveling to other lands, there were also one man on a boat that was a poet that was studying and learning the language and, and, and communing and, and understanding and exchanging things. Um, at the same time that there were people on these lands cultivating singing and ceremony, doing 
beautiful work to preserve what we have here. So, so for me, I have to remind myself a lot not to, not to forget that, not to dip into those like extremes and to realize that it all existed at the same time, you know, and often a house says, um, like him, him coming back to, uh, like European lands, him coming to European lands, being a Mexican person, he's now conquering with flowers and songs. Like that's his mission being here. That's what he feels. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm looking forward to doing another pod one day and him being on the. Pod. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll prep him. Up. We need a bit more time to prep him. Yeah, I can. I can see that. He's ready. He just, yeah, of course he, he is. He just needs to, you know, step into it. Great to have him on. It would. I um. What's next? You know, because there's there's beyond the sweat lodges. There's other ceremonies that you're holding, right? And there's. Mm -hmm. There's um, like certification as well. There's teacher work, right? Teaching. Yeah, yeah we have a rapid training. Like rapid yeah. Training. Yeah. What does the rapid training. What does the rapid training look like? Um, so it's generally for people that have got an, a, an existing relationship with rapid. Um, what we really I found... have to be really mindful of my relationship with rapid. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the reasons we're doing the course as well. Yeah. Um, so rapid is basically a, a traditional indigenous medicine from the Amazon, from the Brazilian region of the Amazon. Um, and it's, it's incredible. It's amazing for grounding. It's used like now we use it maybe before meditation or mm. before ceremony. Traditionally it was used before hunting or f before important meetings yep. to kind of really like focus. It's known as the medicine of the mind, they call it. And so you can imagine why it's great for our society here. <laughs> so with that, um, as plant medicines and other, um, traditional indigenous medicines have kind of worked their way through the world and, and blessed us with their medicine. Um, rapé is one that we noticed and that's it's been a part of a house life for a very long time and for mine less, but I realized that it was growing and shifting and potentially spreading almost too fast without the roots. The reason that we're called root of the gods is because we really care about the roots and they call them like yeah, that's these fair. medicines are the, the foods of the gods, they call them in the Americas. So we were like, where's the root? The, the roots just weren't there with the rapé. Um, people were using it, people were kind of picking it up, but it was like an add-on thing. It was like it wasn't really understood. Yeah, And still I feel that. So the reason for building the course was for people that do feel a connection with rapé and they do want to like use it in their meditation practice or they do want to integrate it into their therapy or facilitation, this is a way that we can translate the knowledge in which we've learned from the Brazilian elders and, and bridge it and also then um, kind of uh, bring about some tools as how we can use that in our modern life. And that's mm -hmm. what we try and do as much as possible because we don't live in indigenous communities in the middle of the jungle and we don't use it before hunting because we don't know hunting, you know? So how can we honor and, and teach people about where these medicines come from whilst also uh, guiding them as to how we might be able to use this in our everyday life in a conscious and, and, and healthy way? Because like you say, with anything, you need to kind of manage your relationship with it. And I think especially with something new and exotic people can get excited and especially if they find uh it helps them in their life the same like coffee or you know anything we can get quite dependent on it or yeah, we can yeah. kind of yeah go, go out of balance so yeah, it was really just to kind of ground ground the medicine and to ground the knowledge and to give people an opportunity to learn a little bit more about um yeah something that they care about and there's something that's helped them as well yeah, I, I love the idea of what it's rooted in. I think that's mm -hmm. expressed beautifully there. Because there, there can be, I think, the using part, you know, because we have a... Transactional yeah. idea of medicine, right? And if you've ever had something where you've used and you've put it up your nose, then there, you, you kind of... There, there is that as well that yeah. you have to work through and be mindful of and within that medicine, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it doesn't feel like I'm just going to have a bump. Exactly. You know, yeah. as opposed to 
what I like now is just to sit and my meditation with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So I think what's next? We what's next? Come on. What's next? <laughs> what's next? Um, I'm Tony. We're just so in the moment. <laughs> yeah. I'm too present to think about what's There's next. There's no next. <laughs> And my ca my cauldron's far too up. <laughs> <laughs> um, for Rue of the Gods, what's next is to to keep uh, nurturing the seeds that we've planted. You know, it's only been three years that we've been holding things in the UK. Wow. Um, so, and our mission with that is to kind of make accessible sweat lodges, community ceremony, normalize it as much as possible, get the children coming, mm. like... The more we do it and the more we're able to kind of find places where we might be able to even build a sweat lodge or, or keep coming back to, um, then the more accessible we can make it as well. Like yeah. the, the more regular it can be. Uh, we've now got some incredible people helping us and, and learning as well. So we would really love to start doing vision quests here in, in the UK. That's kind of a mission for next year to find a place where we can host that because that's process of initiation as well to do four vision quests towards being able to if people want facilitate sweat lodges following that that's one of the traditional routes and uh, the one that i've taken mm -hmm. so yeah the more people that can be hosting sweat lodges and serving so this what's medicine, the, the what's better. okay so the, for those that we're going to go down another rabbit hole now but for the vision <laughs> quest then so can we it what does that look like um, you know, what's the requirement for that? So if someone's listening, they go, yeah, I have that. I, I have a piece of land. You can do that. So uh -huh. there's that. Yeah. Could tick that box. But also for those that perhaps aren't aware what a vision quest even is. Mm -hmm. So the vision quest is a traditional rite of passage uh, from North America. And it's a process where you are um, you're held by the community that you'll arrive into a community where there's a fire, there'll be a sweat lodge and you'll have a teepee ceremony. And then that first night you have your sweat lodge and then you're up all night all together praying around the fire. In the morning you'll eat your food and then you're going to go up into the mountain or out into the woodlands or out into the nature um, with kind of guides or like scouts, people that understand the, the process and the protocol. And when you see or find an area which you feel like it could be home for four days, you'll find your spot. Maybe it's a couple of meters squared. It's not a big area. And they'll kind of cordon it off for you with some like little pouches of prayers that you've made. So they'll put stakes into the earth. and They'll make a little area for you and you stay there for four days and four nights. And you're praying, you're fasting. There's no food, no water, no shelter. So dry fast. Dry yeah. fast. Um, no writing, no reading, no speaking, no singing. No distraction. No stimulation. I have my sleeping bag or blanket, my mala beads, very simple altar. Um, it really clothes, which I quite quickly take off in Mexico because it's hot. <laughs> Here yeah. you might need a jumper, but. Yeah. Um, it's and Alfonso, our grandfather, he says, um, you're not there to suffer, you're there, you're there to pray. Mm -hmm. And again, this Western mind thing, like the first time I was going to go and do it, I said to her, How do I need a knife? And he just laughed at me. I said, So do I need socks? Do I need sunscreen? Do I need this? Do I need that? I had all these questions. Does anyone come to check on me? You know, all of these questions. Yeah. He was just like, No, 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 no. Simplicity. The idea is to be there. And it comes back to, for me, one of my biggest lessons in that was realizing that I also was one that loved nature as long as I was in control. The idea of then being in nature and being nature for four days and four nights on my own in the darkness where insects and scorpions and wild pigs and all of these different things can be also. And to just trust in that totally. Mm was very far from where I was at when I first sat down on that mountain. Yeah. Um, that was one of the biggest gifts for me that I now have with me always is that I feel genuinely at home in nature wherever I land. Hugely empowering as well, right? Yeah. Because if you think about the, 
it's the fear as well, right? Mm -hmm. So the fear comes in. What's that sound? What's this? What's that? Oh my god! And what? Um, the stimulus that comes through that. Yeah. But then closing that, having experienced that. Yeah. Yeah. Until you realise that that insect actually normally takes that route, just you're in its way, and actually yeah. it doesn't really care about you. It's going to go over the rock and over your leg and over your other leg and carry on. And an hour later, there'll be another one coming back the other way. Um, that the wild animal at night that you don't really know what it is, you you know, sit up thinking, yeah, what's that? This mm. is going to walk straight past. You're not the centre of the world. You're mm. not the centre of nature. Yeah, that's the beauty. Um, and that was so humbling to realise. And yet empowering, I felt, I feel still a sense of safety in my body that I never got from a home or from a warm jacket or from mm. another person. Only from just being on that mountain and, and with the elements and, and on my own as well. And you don't have a, a guide, a coach, a shaman, a medicine, a food, a water to distract you or hold you. Um, you hold yourself. And when you can't hold yourself any more, you have to let yourself go into the, into the earth, into the mountain. Um, and really for me, that's where I learned to pray. Mm. I'd never prayed for my life before. I hadn't needed to. I've had, you know, hard moments. But I'd never needed to pray for my own life in that way before. Um, and, and that changed me. Yeah. It's a powerful process, beautiful process. Okay, so when I was listening, we need a we need we need there's a we need a space, yeah, right? like a woodland. Uh, well, do we not need a mountain? Land. It would be great if it's a mountain. I think where you but... go, like what about in uh, even the lakes or somewhere like that? Yeah, because that's quite realistic, yeah. right? That you'd have there's I mean there's a vast territory there to play with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to have a base where that we've got access to fire. Um, because the community keep the fire going for those four days and four nights and they eat and when they drink, they're praying with you. Yeah. So if you want to return from the mountain at any point or from your, your base, your place, you can. And the community is there to hold you. Actually, mm. it was really profound for me. The first two years, because it's a four-year commitment, and this is also what I was speaking to, the the process to to hold the sweat lodge altar to facilitate sweat lodges is that four year process because you'll go through a lot of sweat lodges in those four years. Um, so the first two years uh, I completed all four days and four nights and then those guides, they remember where you are on the mountain, they come back and get you and then you come back down the mountain, you go straight into the sweat lodge, a shorter one, 15 minutes. And then you all come back into the teepee and you all eat and drink together at the same time with um yeah the same water that you left there before so again there's like this protocol there's just this depth and detail um that's thousands of years old um what was i going to say about it being here ah the third year so the third year that i that i took the vision quest and i was there on the mountain and on the third day uh, I had my bleed. I had my bleed the first year and the third year that I did it, which is, again, just such a primal, powerful process for a mm. woman to go through to just bleed raw onto the mountain, onto the earth. A blessing that many of us have never even done. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, and the third day, it was actually a, the voice of one of the elders that we work with, Eugenia, and she just said, that's enough now. Enough now. I was like, oh, that's enough now. And it wasn't like this, um, you know, calculated process. It was just like, your process is done. Like, that's enough. And each year represents something um, different as well. And this year was sincerity. The third year represents sincerity. And then my ego came in and my mind, like, oh, what will Alfonso think? And what will Al think? And da, 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 I'm not completing the four days. I'm not doing the extreme. I'm not ticking the box, you know, all this. Um, rather than seeing the divine timing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> rather than accepting what already is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I cried and I, and I grieved 
that like this idea that I had to do or be you know I had to complete something or be somebody to receive what I was there to receive Mm. but it was still transactional even three years in you know in some way and so I cried and I packed up my things and then I thought shit I don't actually know the way back down like I'm just gonna have to walk back down because I've never even thought about going back down um so I packed up my things and I took the stakes out of the earth and wrapped up my prayers and put them on my back and I walked back down the mountain and I came back into the the camp like the base and it was almost like in those um movies where you see kind of like an like someone from an outside village come into a village and it's like immediately everyone notices they they know what's going on apart from the first person to notice was a child and I'm not supposed to you don't look into anyone's eyes until you've gone into the sweat lodge and you've eaten your food and everything there's like a, a process in that so I was just kind of walking with my head down but I saw a child in the in the corner of my eye that sat up moved then suddenly someone's coming to take my bag then suddenly someone's coming to bring me a plate of watermelon and some water and guide me to the teepee where I would sit with the fire and I'd offer a bit of the water and the food to the fire and then I would eat myself. But that process to realise that even though I hadn't completed what I said I would do, I was still loved and supported immediately in, in any way that I needed to complete this prayer by this community of people that maybe I still hadn't accepted were there to support me directly because I was the partner of a Mexican. I thought Mm. like I'm I'm a partner of one of them. So that's why they're helping me. But I walked down there on my own and they were there to hold and support and honor the prayers that I had been offering to the mountain. Mm. And that broke my heart open. like Just to realize that even if I don't do the things or complete the things or achieve, I am loved and worthy and it's all perfect. It's all just how accepted, it's supposed to be. Like accepted, in, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was my sincerity, you know, to be sincere with that taught me so much. So... So yeah, if we're if we're talking about how it could happen in the UK, it would be yeah, a place where we can hold that love and that container at the bottom of the mountain or in the woodlands, mm-hmm. wherever it would be, for people Feels to like go the mountain's and a piece of it. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, for me, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's done in the jungle. It's done yeah everywhere, but yeah, mountains. For me, I feel to see far. Could be a new way of doing the three peaks. Yeah, vision quest. Vision peaks. Vision, vision peaks. peaks. <laughs> three vision peaks. Yes. I don't have to do it three times yeah. in a row, but <laughs> yeah, and and for it to be a space where we can be in silence and pray, and to not see or hear other people, you need to be on your own. Yeah. If it's woodlands or mountain, that's not that. It doesn't need to be huge. Like... Very tricky in the UK, right? Yeah. Not to be on a mountain and it be so quiet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking here, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would be possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All doable. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> you know that that's enough. It really reminds me of a friend, and um, I won't give any names, but he was away um, working with a plant, and he was describing how it had rained for days, and he kind of had enough of this rain, and whatever the plant was he was working with, he didn't feel like it was really working Mm -hmm. for him and he was given a bit more medicine and eventually it just like full on out and found himself in this central hut and it was two i think it's two women shaman working there holding the space and he found himself kind of on his hands and knees making his way to one of these women that he thinks is the one that's holding the space and he's got his head on a but <laughs> just asking for help. Oh. I think. And she was really looking after him. And it had gone on for quite some time. And then the moment when, obviously, he's now back in the room, he doesn't realise it quite yet, but she knows. And she went, that's enough now. Yeah. So in, yeah. you know. 
so in that energy. That level of knowing is so powerful. It's fair enough. Um, have you had much um, connection to um, Sundance? Me personally. Or as a how? Is he? Yes, he's supported it for I don't know how long. I couldn't really speak much to that. Okay, I'm going to pick um, his brains after this. Yeah. It's something that was, I, <clears throat> I've been drawn to it for so long, like numbers of years, um, speaking to different people about it. But it's never really because of kids. Mm. And then Bowman dropped in, so that's five years ago nearly. And um, I feel there's a, both of us, Katerina and I, it feels like there's a little bit more breathing space right now as mm -hmm. he's five, will be soon, very soon. Well, Alfonso, the same grandfather that hosts our Vision Quest, he hosts the Sundance, so it's straight after. Some people do the Vision Quest and straight after the Sundance. Um, but he hosts them in Germany, the mm. Sundance. And, yeah, I mean, he would love to host them in the UK. If we could find that land, we could do it at the same time. We've got to get this house and land. Yeah. <laughs> house and land, house and land. You can drop it all there. Yeah. We'll be there. Yeah, okay. it would be magical to find find a place, especially because with the Vision Quest, with the Sweat Lodge, with the Sun Dance, with the Moon Dance, they're all removings. And I think that in our modern culture, there's so much adding. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's fasting, it's shedding, it's praying. There's no, you're not adding anything. You're just connecting like we've spoken to. Letting go letting of go. letting go. Letting, you're letting go of letting go. Yeah. And coming back to, yeah, just being human in whatever form that shows. Yeah. Okay. So we're almost there with the what's next. So we have Frappe, sweat lodges that you're going to be growing here, mm -hmm. community that will grow through that, and Vision Quest. Sounds amazing. Yeah. How do we find you? How do we find all this stuff, Robin? So uh, our project is called Root of the Gods. Roots like the root of the tree, roots yeah. like what goes into the earth. So our website is rootofthegods.com. Our Instagram is rootofthegods, at rootofthegods. Uh, and you can join our mailing list. That's probably the best way to kind of stay in touch with what events and things we've got coming up. Um, and we're doing monthly sweat lodges here at 42 Acres. We're going to be doing the event in Norfolk. Kindred. Yeah, 100 Human. Uh -huh. Kindred. 100 Kindred. Human Experience. Human. Kindred. And that's in October. We are, yeah, hosting around the UK. We're usually here in the summer. And then in Mexico in the winter, we hold two retreats with the Mazatec community over there. So, yeah. When do you head back? Is it kind of November time? What, what is it it would like? usually be November time, but we've got <laughs> baby coming in November time. So, I know, Well, there's the what's next. Yeah, right? that's another what's next. <clears throat> what's next? We're having a baby. Save the best till last, Robin. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of rites of passage. Yeah. Yeah. The first, yeah, baby. Our first baby. So mm. that will be November time. So we're planning a home birth here in the UK and then heading back to Mexico in mid-January, February. So in October, like with the sweat lodge. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Good thing. Be some Norfolk full, is close like, to mama it. energy coming into that one, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Norfolk's not that far from us. So I was, yeah, glad to see that it was in Norfolk. So I was like, <laughs> driving all the way down here, maybe at that point's not a good idea. But I definitely feel being around the fire and holding space from the outside of the lodge, which is where I'm at at the moment, um, is really helping me to. It is like a rite of passage, actually fulfilling the role of facilitating holding space and being in ceremony, but in a totally different way. Mm. You know, I'm having, have, I'm already having to learn a lot of how to be more mother, actually. Yeah. And it's challenging. Well, the preparation of that, right? Yeah, yeah. Already teaching you. Yeah. That softness and, and where I still were, was pushing myself or uh, not really honouring that space or that softness or that slowness. Um, yeah, when people ask me how pregnancy's been so far, it's basically a huge learning journey. Yeah. Just learning constantly in, in so many different ways. And I'm so grateful that it 
does not give you a choice to not be in your body. Yeah. Like, I'm just in my body all the time. I can't not be aware of the, the twitches and movements and mm. things. And so my brain works differently. The way I speak, I feel, is different. The things that come to me are different because I'm much more in my body. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Exciting and it, scary, and yeah, all of those things at the same time. Fascinating. Something. Well, as a as a man, we can't fully connect to. But being, you know, papa to four kids and seeing that, witnessing that, observing that, mm -hmm. is the most remarkable thing. Yeah. To think, you know, suddenly there's there were there's there's two bodies there right now. Yeah. It's, it's mind blowing. Yeah, it always is mind boggling, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, for us too, I think, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. And then there's the you know that they that I always had this that they they choose us, and so that's mm -hmm. that's the beauty of that as well. Of thinking, oh wow, okay. Mm -hmm. So if ever there's any uncertainty in my mind of, oh, am I am I going to be able to do this? Mm -hmm. Am it's, I good enough? Do I have the right tools yeah. or money or this or that? Of course that? I am. They chose me. So yeah, I'm I'm there. Yeah. Yeah. There's the other thing that can come in, you know, and we've had friends with this. There is a, there can be a grieving, you know, like the letting go of the, and, the, and it's almost like the fast, the, the, the quicker you can get to the point where I'm now a parent, rather than trying to hold on to the days when you weren't, when you weren't a parent. Yeah. I want to get my life back to here. Yeah. And it's like that, minimizing that as best you can because it's so you're stepping into something just. That will is far far more potent than those days of which you could call loneliness. Yeah, mm, that's interesting. Yeah, because now it's like there's constantly constant, <laughs> absolutely <Relentless>. constant, <laughs> lovely constant. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. That's a good place to finish. We should call this um, <laughs> constant, letting go. relentless, constant. Letting go. Letting go. <laughs> Cheers. Thank for you, that. Robin. Thank you, Tony. Amazing. Um, I voiced this out um, at the Sweat Lodge while we were standing there and you, you and how, and you were doing an opening. And I said, no, no, can, can I just say something? And it stopped the whole thing. And I think it stopped you. And you were, yeah. And you had kind of, there was the baby, right? So there was like, Tony, I've just now got to think about what I was saying. <laughs> and I just stopped everything and said, I just have to say how beautiful you both are, you know? <laughs> and it's true. You, you are both beautiful beings. Oh, thank you a, so much for having it's me. It's a real privilege. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As always, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. If you feel drawn to do so, then please subscribe to the show, leave a review, and don't forget to share. Sharing is caring. It really helps me to help others. If you're drawn to immersing yourself in any of the NatLife experiences or see yourself as a NatLife coach, head to tonyriddle.com for details of how to immerse yourself in the community. You can follow my adventures on Instagram at the natural lifestylist big shout out to simon from we are the clarks for producing filming editing much love <laughs>